Today in calculus, we're going to be looking at the squeeze theorem of limits. The squeeze theorem is sometimes called the sandwich theorem or even the pinching theorem. In the squeeze theorem, if a function with an unknown limit as x approaches a value c can be shown to be between two functions with the same limit as x approaches c, then the original function must have the same limit. In our diagram, we show three functions f of x, which is less than g of x, which is less than h of x, as long as we're in an interval around a. As we're looking at this, we see that in this interval, we have that f of x is less than g of x, which is less than h of x, which is what our notation here sh shows for all of our x values around c. We'll call that c. Okay, so if we can then find the limit of f of x and the limit of h of x to be reaching some value l, then g of x in between must also have that same limit of l. We're going to use the results of this squeeze theorem to find the limit of a function that we're going to use over and over again in our development of calculus. The function that we're interested in is f of x equals sine x divided by x. And we want to prove that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1. If we just substitute 0 in for x in each of these situations, we would have sine 0 over 0, which is 0 over 0, which of course is indeterminate. So we need to change the form or come up with another way to evaluate this limit. What we're going to do is we're going to find two other functions that sine x over x is sandwiched in between. To do that, we're going to make use of a little bit of geometry and the unit circle. So here we have a diagram. This is our unit circle, so our radius out here is 1. And we have an angle right here, which we're going to call theta. We could call it x, but just for now, we're going to call it theta. And as we look here, we're looking at a couple of right triangles on our picture. And as we look at this point right here on our right triangle, it's the x and y coordinates of our unit circle. So we know those coordinates are cos theta, sine theta. Now we're going to use those because we're going to take a look at this triangle, which I'm going to draw in green right here. And we're going to write an expression for that area. We're going to compare it to the area of this arc length, which is clearly larger than the first triangle. And we're going to compare both of those to the area of this larger triangle, which is tangent to the circle at the point 1, 0. So let's take a look at each one of these areas and see what we can come up with. Our first one, we have this triangle. Since the x and the y coordinates are cos theta, sine theta, we know in this triangle that this distance, the base is cos theta, and the height is sine theta. So the area of this triangle is 1 half cos theta times sine theta. Now let's move to the sector of the circle, which I've outlined in red. The sector of a circle, area of a sector of a circle, is equal to 1 half r squared times the angle. Since our radius is, is 1, our area of the sector that we have here is 1 half theta. Now, our next triangle that we're looking at is the one that we have outlined in blue. And as we look at this triangle that's outlined in blue, notice that our base is going to be 1. So we're looking at a triangle with a base of 1. 
and our height, if we look at our values of our height, if we first call that y, we know that the tangent of theta equals opposite over adjacent is y over 1. So this height y is equal to the tangent of theta. So the area of this triangle is 1 half the base of 1 times the height of the tangent theta, or tan 1 half tangent theta. And we know the order of the size of each of these triangles. We have 1 half cos theta sine theta is less than or equal to 1 half theta, which is less than or equal to 1 half tan theta. Now this is great, but I don't see anywhere in here where I have a sine x over x or a sine theta over theta. So we're going to have to change our inequality a little bit. To start with, we can multiply both sides or all three parts of this inequality by 2 to get rid of the fraction 1 half. So we have cos theta, sine theta, less than or equal to theta, less than or equal to tan theta. And of course, tan theta can also be written as sine theta over cos theta. Well, as we're looking at our goal to have sine theta over theta or sine x over x here, I notice that if it needs to be in between, I need a sine theta somehow in the middle. And I can easily get that by dividing this inequality by sine theta. As we're looking at this, we're in our first quadrant of our unit circle, so I know sine theta is positive, so I can safely divide by sine theta without it changing the signs of our inequality. So dividing by sine theta gives us cos theta less than or equal to theta divided by sine theta less than or equal to 1 over cos theta. Okay, almost looks right. I want sine x over x or sine theta over theta. I've got the reciprocal of that. So using the reciprocal property of inequalities, I can rewrite this as 1 over cos theta greater than or equal to the reciprocal sine theta over theta greater than or equal to, again, the reciprocal cos theta over 1, or just cos theta. So now I have the middle term exactly the way I want it. So I've got the functions. I have my f of x, in this case, greater than or equal to a g of x greater than or equal to an h of x. So now I can do the limit of these functions and get the limit of the function in between because it's sandwiched in between there. So let's do the limit as our theta approaches 0 of 1 over cos theta. That's going to end up being greater than or equal to the limit as theta approaches 0 of our target function, sine theta over theta, greater than or equal to the limit as theta approaches 0 of cos theta. Okay. Well, the cosine of 0 here is just 1. So our first limit, 1 divided by 1, is 1. Our limit on our other side, as theta goes to 0, the cos of 0 is, again, 1. So I have it sandwiched in between 1 and 1. So that tells us that the limit of theta approaches 0 of sine theta over theta has to be between 1 and 1. Therefore, it has to equal 1. So the limit as theta approaches 0 of sine theta over theta has to equal 1. Now, where are we going to use this particular limit? One of the things that we can use it with is to evaluate other limits. So let's see if we can use the results of our limit of sine x over x equal to 1 as x approaches 0 in some other applications. So our first one is going to find the limit as x approaches 0 of tan x over x. Tangent of x can be written as sine x over cos x. So we're going to rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over cos x 
And of course, dividing by x is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal 1 over x. So I've changed this to a product. Now I can rearrange my fraction. I can group the sine x over the x, switching my cos x and x in the denominator here. And I can rewrite it as the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x times 1 over cos x. Using the properties of limits, I can split this into a product of two limits. We have the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x multiplied by the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over cos x. Evaluating each of those limits, the limit of sine x over x is equal to 1. The limit of 1 over cos x as x goes to 0. We have the cosine of 0, which is 1. So we have 1 times 1, which is 1. So here's our limit. Okay. Let's do another one. This one involves a sine and a polynomial function, 2x squared minus x. Again, my goal is to get something in the form sine x divided by x. So in my denominator, I somehow need to get an x isolated. And I can do that by factoring in the denominator. So I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x divided by x times 2x minus 1. Okay, and we can regroup this. We see sine x divided by x. So let's rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x times 1 over 2 minus x. Again, I can split this product into two limits using our product rule of limits. Limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x multiplied by the limit, again, as x approaches 0 of 1 divided by 2x minus 1. Calculating each limit, our first limit is 1. Our second one is we substitute. We use direct substitution principle. We put 0 in for x, so we have 1 divided by negative 1 or negative 1. And so this limit is negative 1. Okay. Let's look at a couple of more of those limits. Our next one that we want to show is um, a multiple of x. That sine of ax divided by ax is equal to 1. Well, we're going to do that by looking at a simpler limit. We're going to look to see what happens with just the ax part. So we're going to look at u equal to ax. And we're going to take the limit as x approaches 0 of u, or the limit as x approaches 0 of ax. On the right, using that principle, substituting 0 in here, we get that this is just equal to 0. So what we've seen here is that as x approaches 0, so also u approaches 0. And u is defined as a times x. Let's use the results of that to simplify or to rewrite this limit. We're going to rewrite sine of ax as the sine of u. And ax is u. And so now the limit as we're looking at, we're looking at variable u, we had as x goes to 0, can be replaced with u going to 0. And we have a limit that is exactly the same as our um, base limit here, sine x over x going to 1. We just had a change of variables. And so this is equal to 1. What this tells us is it doesn't matter what multiple we have here for x, as long as the 3x and the 3x agree, this limit is going to come out to be 1. Let's take a look at one more example. Here we have a product of two terms. We have x squared times the sine of 1 over x. Um, the limit of sine of 1 over x is a limit that we have looked at before. We kind of took a peek at it, and we found that this limit does not exist. 
great. How does that apply to this one? And how can we show it equals zero? Well, we're going to make use of the idea of that squeeze theorem, and we're going to focus in on the sine of 1 over x. We know that the sine of any function is between negative 1 and 1. That's our range of the sine function. So we have this compound inequality, and we're looking to get our part in the middle to look like x squared times sine 1 over x. Well, I can get that by multiplying this compound inequality by the positive number x squared. So multiplying by x squared gives us negative x squared less than or equal to x squared sine of 1 over x less than or equal to positive x squared. And now, just like we did in proving our limit sine x over x, we're going to apply the squeeze theorem. We're going to do the limit of those two outside functions here, and that is going to then squeeze the middle function in between them. So we're going to do the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared. Substituting in 0, we get 0. And on the right, we're going to do the limit as x approaches 0 of positive x squared, and that also goes to 0, which means that right in between, we have the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times the sine of 1 over x. And that value also must be 0. So we have shown that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times the sine of 1 over x must be 0. And that's our lesson on the squeeze theorem for today.